today's episode is filled with so much good information. It's not even funny. I know you guys are going to love this episode. This is Dr. Peter Kozlowski. He's been on the show before. We call him Dr. Koz. He's a functional medicine doc that just is such a straight shooter. I appreciate it so much. He's like, here's what you need to know with the most pertinent information that is easy to understand and make sense. And here's what you can do about it. Oh my gosh, such a breath of fresh air. So he has a new book out called Get the Funk Out. His first book was called Unfunk Your Gut. Um, So obviously very specialized in the gut, but also he's a functional medicine doctor, so he does it all. And this one is like kind of his missing pieces, he says. It's all about balancing your hormones and detoxing. So we get into it, like so much good info, the thyroid, the adrenals, um, blood sugar, female hormones, male hormones, detoxing, mold. Oh my gosh, the mold part at the end is so good. But yeah, uh, make sure you don't miss the part about testosterone for males because I know there's a lot of guys out there on TRT and you're going to want to hear what he had to say about that. Um, just wow, so good. Make sure you get his book. Like this is like, I would consider this just, you know, some books are just like, it's like a resource. So you just want, it's like, oh yeah, I got to go look it up in there. That's this kind of book. So we'll link it in the show notes. Get the funk out. Um, you can find him on at his website is doc-cause.com. All right, let's get into it. So much good stuff coming your way. Here is Dr. Peter Kozlowski. All right, Dr. Koz, I've got your new book. If you guys aren't watching on YouTube, I'm holding up his new book called Get the Funk Out, A Functional Medicine Guide to Balance Your Hormones and Detox. I'm excited to talk to you because since the last time we talked about your first book, was your last book, your first book? Yes. Okay, so if you guys didn't hear that one, unfunk your gut. Okay. So that we have an episode about that one, which is awesome. And this one's get the funk out about detox and balancing your hormones. But what you don't know is I have become literally obsessed with the gut microbiome since we last talked. And it is like, I'm probably at least 10 hours, at least 10 hours a week of research. Like if I have free time at night, like it's gut research, like I'm super obsessed with the gut microbiome, it is the most fascinating thing in the world. Right. And although there's so much we don't know, there's so much we're learning and it's really exciting. So that I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, first of all, why did you write this follow-up book? Yeah, I never thought I would. Um, and I just want to say, I'm looking forward to your gut book when it comes out. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just a, a, a fixionado and definitely helps in my coaching, but yeah, <laughs> With that amount of research, you could definitely write it. <laughs> um, yeah. So when I describe functional medicine, it's all about the underlying cause, right? And, and what, that's why people come to me. So whether you've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's estrogen dominance, low T, uh, your child autism, dementia, and your parents or autoimmune disease, whatever. The, the point is working with a functional medicine doctor is to figure out the why. Yeah. And there's five areas that we look and they are food, gut health, hormone imbalances, toxins, and mental, emotional, spiritual health. And so the first book, Unfunk Your Gut, was about diet, nutrition, gut, and mental, emotional, spiritual, mm-hmm. health, right? And so I, did, I honestly didn't even think I would write a second one. And then I kind of started realizing, I'm like, well, there's really only two subjects left that that I find the highest yield, and they were hormones and toxins. And so I thought, why not? Like, I, let me just get this out there. And because yeah. I've had a lot of experience working with all the different hormone glands and and detox. Um, And I feel pretty passionately about the connection between the two, which a lot of people, it sounds kind of nuts, like a book that's half about hormones and toxins. But um, in my opinion, I could diagnose anybody with a hormonal imbalance, like literally anybody. Um, And that's because, so the five hormones that I focus on in the book are, and what I see the most commonly over the years in my practice are thyroid, adrenal glands insulin imbalances, which comes from the pancreas. And then I broke it down into reproductive hormones, male versus female hormones. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I say I could find an imbalance in any of those five is anybody who read my first book or heard our first pod, um, mental, emotional, spiritual health is the core of all of this. And, and if I can't find anything in your thyroid or your estrogen or your testosterone or your insulin, I can almost find, almost always find something with the adrenal glands because we're all under a lot of stress. Yeah. It's different. It looks different for all of us. Um, but so I could argue and that 
hormones are also something that the imbalances can come and go, right? Like if it's, it's maybe somebody's adrenal glands are worse off from the holidays, right? A lot of us are seeing family or that we don't normally see, and that could be a very stressful situation or traveling. And, 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 um, so the adrenal glands could be kind of shot and then you take a vacation in January and they kind of get back going and then you get back to work. And, and so, um, that's one where I can pretty much always find an imbalance. I do like thyroid disease is the most common, uh, autoimmune disease. It's, it's pretty much everybody at this point knows either takes a thyroid hormone or uh, medicine or knows somebody that's on thyroid or, yeah. you know, so it, it's very common. Um, the, the interesting one to write about for me was the, the insulin and the blood sugar. Um, because if I worked in a family practice office, like I was trained as a GP, and if I just worked in a traditional office, I'd guess probably 90% of my patients would have blood sugar issues just in a 90%. Yeah. Like your yeah. average American, like, um, yeah. you know, you're the, um, I don't know how to say it, but it, I mean, obesity and blood sugar are massive right. problems. In this if country. you're eating a standard American diet, as you, you get older, it is, you are most likely going to have blood sugar issues. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, but in my practice, I don't see it. Um, people that come to me have usually done a lot with their yeah. diet. Usually I don't, I'm not dealing with that very often, but I, I mean, especially with the whole COVID thing. And, and I mean, I think we're seeing very strongly that the biggest risk is blood sugar. Um, and, and yeah. So I talk about uh, like diagnosing what I call pre-pre-diabetes. Mm. Um, and what's that? Like reg regular medicine uses um, a couple markers to screen you for diabetes. And then, so they'll look at your fasting glucose, um, which is just your blood sugar after you haven't eaten for eight hours. Mm -hmm. And then they like to look at what's called hemoglobin A1C. Um, and that's a marker of what your blood sugar has looked like for the last three months. Mm -hmm. Um, cause your red blood cells kind of regenerate every three months. So it, you can look at what the blood sugars have averaged. They put a number mm -hmm. on it and then you can calculate what the average was. What I've always done in my patients is test fasting insulin. And that's what I call pre pre diabetes mm. because what diabetes is type two, which is the most common one is when you've basically been eating so much sugar that your body has been releasing way more insulin than it should be. And the receptors stop working. So your body's just mm -hmm. pumping out more insulin to have a minimum, to have a small effect. Mm -hmm. So on a blood test, if you do a fasting insulin, the, the range is usually like between two and 20 roughly. And I want to see your fasting insulin, like between two and five. And, and I think we'd be at least practicing more preventative medicine. If that, mm. I don't think a traditional yeah. doctor is ever testing your fasting insulin. And, right. And Rarely. I think it, to me, it just makes sense, right? Like if yeah. your insulin is high in the morning, that means you're having to produce a lot. That means your receptors are probably not starting to work as well. And so that's where I would, you know, I think we could catch even more cases of, you know, totally pre-diabetes and get warned people like, Hey, like, right trending in the wrong direction. Um, yeah. It's kind of like when you point that out and the fact that that's not being tested, it's like nonsensical, you know, it's like, we're looking for signs of insulin resistance, and you, but we're not even going to check to see if you're on that path. Like it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The, the test is very easy. Like it's part of the same blood draw that would get right. you a glucose level and a hemoglobin A1C. And right. It's like, but I, and I mean, it goes back to my belief around most of medicine is that it's, it's just all about meds. And so yes. like metformin, the most common medication for diabetes is approved I think, for pre-diabetes. But I think if you were going for pre, pre-diabetes, that's a little premature to go on yeah. metformin. Right. So, so what's a regular point? doctor diagnose you with pre, pre-diabetes, they'd have no clue what to tell you. Right. It'd be like, well, go see the nutritionist and, yeah. and you know, exercise yeah. more. And, and so they wouldn't really know what to do with it. Um, yeah. so I think that's why maybe they're not doing it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, Cause like what, what's the, it's like they're testing for <laughs> things they can give meds for. And it's true. It's yeah. true. And I've kind of come to a place where I'm like, just don't expect, just don't expect your Western medicine doctor to be doing the, the, the thing that you said when you kicked this off was we're looking at why yeah. they don't, that's not what yeah. they offer. So just yeah. know that. 
and then choose your functional medicine doctor or naturopath doctor, whatever, like, you know, like we just yeah. have to educate like that. They, you know, cause people get frustrated, right? Yeah. Why'd they just put me on an antidepressant? How come they didn't? It's like, they're not trained in that. They, that's not what they do. So right. you go into the wrong person. You're going to the auto mechanic to get your piano fixed. Like they don't do that, you know? Yeah, that's great, yeah. You're <laughs> okay. Totally right. Okay. So I love this. So, um, adrenals, you know, let's kind of go through each of these if that's sure. okay. So, yeah. so, um, with the adrenals, you're saying, you know, the, the first biomarker you're looking for is related to blood sugar with the adrenals or not. No, I kind of jumped around. So, okay. They, okay. Um, but they are connected though. So I, right. I kind of jumped into the pancreas and insulin chapter, but the, with the adrenals, um, you know, those are our stress response glands. They basically make hormones in response to stress. And, and one of those hormones is cortisol. Yeah. And so that's what we can test. And, and uh, my preferred testing is saliva testing, um, mm -hmm. which is basically like you spit into a little tube at 7 a.m., 11 a.m., 3 p.m., and bedtime like 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. And what a traditional or what a normal cortisol curve looks like is, is it starts high in the morning. There's a massive drop, um, by midday, and then it kind of slowly levels off until bedtime. And then it, by the time you wake up, it's up again. And yep. so that would be a normal cortisol. Um, the other thing that's on a saliva test is DHEA levels. Um, and I want to comment on that too. So because I'm so passionate about the mental, emotional, spiritual part, and most of my patients are in denial about it or don't want to talk about it. I'm like, well, let's, let's see and, and do the <laughs> adrenal testing and, and let's see if, if I'm onto something <laughs> or not. And, and most of them don't want to do it, but, um, when they do, I call it like my stress test, right? Yeah. Like, like your cardiologist has their cardiac stress test. I have my adrenal stress test. Mm -hmm. And so I can see, you know, there, and there's, some people argue there's three stages of adrenal fatigue. Some people argue four. I more lean towards three, which is basically stage one is like an acute stress. So you, you know, we hang up and I check my email and there's some, you know, worrisome email. And then, mm -hmm. so then my cortisol is going to spike because I'm worried. Mm -hmm. um, stage two is basically when it's been chronic, when I'm living under this state of, um, just chronic stress. So my cortisol is just high all the time. Mm -hmm. And stage three is basically when the, the adrenal glands have had enough and, yeah. and that they're there. That's like true adrenal fatigue. Um, so that's a way to look at it. And that's where I say, usually people are either in one or two, it's very rare that they go all the way to three, but most people are in stage one or two. Mm -hmm. Um, that more is looking at what more recent, right? And so a lot of people are like, well, is this chronic or not? And so that's where the DHEA levels come in. Mm. And <clears throat> all of our hormones are made from cholesterol. And so you have a limited substrate. So you have this limited amount of cholesterol to make your hormones. And when the adrenal gland is making hormones, it can either make aldosterone, which is a blood pressure hormone. It can make cortisol, which is your stress hormone, or it makes DHEA and the reproductive hormones. So there's the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone through like a multi-part pathway. So ideally you're, you have a balance, right? You're, you're balancing enough cholesterol turning into testosterone, enough into estrogen, enough in aldosterone. However, since our bodies are super smart, if you're chronically under that sympathetic nervous response, fight or flight, your body will choose to make cortisol before anything else, because right. that you're, you're in survival mode. So what happens is, is if, if the, you know, the stressors have been very chronic, you will see a low DHEA level on that adrenal test. And that's the way that I can say like, okay, this looks like you're under stage two of adrenal fatigue. And this looks like it's been chronic because your DHEA levels are low. Um, mm. So that, you know, I, I love doing that testing as just like a wake up call for people that don't want to admit that like, you know, yeah. their relationships or their families or their kids or their job or whatever yeah. are more of an issue than they want to acknowledge. Because when you're in, living in that state and that gets to insulin is like um, cortisol does two main things when it's being released and it causes blood sugar to be released and it causes your immune system to be suppressed. Mm -hmm. And so then that gets into like your favorite thing, the gut microbiome. 
candida overgrowth is a very common thing, right? And, yeah. and there's so many people online that that have convinced people that the only way to treat candida is through diet. And and but if you're so stressed out about your diet and you're releasing all this cortisol, your candida is still going to grow. And then that's going to make you make more insulin. And eventually that's going to contribute to diabetes. So exactly. Th- these things are connected. Um, yeah. And so that that's definitely one of my favorite ones to look at. Um, question for you on the DHEA yeah. thing. Like yeah. if someone has really healthy fasted insulin and really healthy cortisol response and their DHEA, DHEA is on the lower side, can that just be age related? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Could be. Yeah. Okay, cool. But yeah, so kind of correlating that it's like fasted insulin is kind of going up, the cortisol is kind of on the higher side and then it's like low DHEA. Okay, bingo. Yeah. I love that you have a stress test like that too. I think all of us have things like that. When I used to train people in person, I would ask them what their stress levels were like and they were always fine, always fine. Most of the time, every once you get once in a while, you get a vulnerable person, but I would be like, okay, cool. All right, so let's lay down and um, I just want you to close your eyes and just breathe. And I would just watch to see if they were chest breathing or belly breathing <laughs> And it was like liar. <laughs> I'm like, mm-hmm. so oh, how is work going? <laughs> yeah, that's funny that we we come up with things like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? I, I, I want to highlight something you said because I think it's beneficial for the listeners. This fear of finding out, the fear of finding out, like, I don't even want to know. And I think it's, it's rooted in this. There's nothing I'm going to be able to do. I'm going to find out there's something wrong with me. And I'm going to just like have this, you know, it's almost like I got diagnosed with cancer just because my DHEA levels were low. And, and like, will you speak on that? Cause I'm just like, no, like there's so many solutions for you. And once you actually know what's going yeah. on, like, right. it's not scary. Can you, yeah. can you speak on that? I mean, I would say it is scary. Um, you know, in my story that I think we talked about the first time is just I'm in recovery. I, I got through high school and med school and, and residency as a binge drinker. And so what opened me up to mental, emotional, spiritual health was accepting that I had a problem with alcohol. Um, yeah, I really fought it because I was not like a daily drinker. I, I didn't need to drink, but I just really liked it. I just would not drink too much. Mm-hmm. But I had to get honest and admit that it was a problem and yeah. that took a long time. And, yeah. And so I totally, and that's step one in recovery. If someone follows 12 step program um, yeah. is acceptance. And, yeah. and so to me, acceptance changes everything and you yeah. can't go any farther until you do. And so even for my patients that, you know, some people don't want to hear it and they won't come back to me, but at least I've like hopefully planted that seed of like, Hey, there might be something here. And and once you know that you kind of can't unknow it. That, yeah. that was like the worst part for me is like, once I knew that I had a problem with alcohol, whenever I did drink after that, I was like, Oh, like this sucks. Yeah. Um, I, I always say knowing is better, you know, and I, from my perspective, I guess, you know, I, I know there's a lot of, uh, subconscious beliefs and, you know, traumas and lack of belief in oneself to be able to make the changes in their life. And I, and I totally understand that and have passion on it. I guess my, my message is just like, you, you got this, you can yeah. do it. You definitely can. And when, you know, you'll be more likely to, because just like you said, it's like, man, like every single time, you know, like when I have somebody with histamine issues, mm-hmm. like just telling them, I'm like, so alcohol, like, do you break out in rashes or like, like what happens to you when you drink? Yeah, it's bad. It's bad. And I'm like, okay. So just so you know, yeah. there's su- it's super high in histamines and it blocks the enzyme for you to break down histamine. So it's literally just so mean. It's so yeah. mean to yourself. You can do it. Just know what you're just, I want you to know what's happening, why that's happening. And it kind of changes you. It's like, Oh God, do I really want to do that to myself today? You know, do I really want right. to feel like that tomorrow? It's like, you can just know, just understand what's happening, you know? So Okay. Okay. So as, as someone that's like felt hopeless many times and, and like mm-hmm. had to get back up from very difficult situations. Um, yeah. I, I very much understand it. And like yeah. one of my therapists once said that change was as easy as like ripping off your own skin. Yeah. Um, so I don't ever judge anyone for, for no. not wanting to deal with it. Um, right. but I know that that's where the real magic happens. Um, yeah at least, you know, with gut health, with detox, with mental health, like that, that's the key to all of it. Um, so 
It, and compassion, I just have to say, is so important. You know, I always tell people, like, if we got something on the first try, like, I mean, I've played basketball before. I should be Michael Jordan. I should be LeBron James. You know, like, yeah. you, we don't just, like, become perfect at something just because we tried it the very first time. We're, like, professionals. I'm like, you're going to drink again. You're going to binge eat again. It's okay. Just just we're learning. Just allowing. Yeah. Say, hey, it's okay. I wonder what's going on there. Like, it's okay. How do I feel? Okay. It's just you're, it's, you're, I always, my binge eaters, especially I'm like, you are, let's just establish you're going to binge eat again. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, okay. And I'm like, okay. So when it happens next time, all I want you to do is like, put your hands on your heart and just afterwards just say, Hey, I wonder what was actually going on there. And that's all that's just um, no judgment on it. Just let's start there. You know, so compassion yeah. is really key on like, because what happens is when you drink again, or you binge eat again, it, it's, it's like, Oh, and you push yourself down and it's like, I hate myself. And you're just in that. So that doesn't keep going. Serve anyone. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Let's get more into the nitty gritty. Cause you have so much good information to share. Yeah. Um, okay. So is that kind of the big one on adrenals, what you just shared? And, okay. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And, and just that was... to answer your, your last question is just different things work for different people, whether yeah. it's what yeah. type of therapy you're doing, what type right. of exercise you're doing, whether you're doing, you know, using food, if you're doing 12 step groups or yep. church yep. stuff or, you yep. know, so, and even for me, what, what I do now looks different than what I was doing a year ago. And yep. it probably look, so it's, it's constant. It's a life journey. And for me personally, it's at least a decision every day to wake up and be like, Hey, I, I'm going to focus on today, live yeah. in the moment, um, practice gratitude, practice grace, and uh, accept that, you know, I need to work on myself. Yeah. And be, be kind to yourself. Like I, I feel like marathon running really forever changed my self-talk. Cause when things get hard, it's just like, you got this, you're doing great. You got yeah, just hang in there. You got it. You got it. Come on, keep going. You're good. Good. Yeah. It's okay. You know, like that kind of self-talk goes a long way and you're exactly right. I always say with, with healing modalities, you know, what spiritual, emotional, mental, physical, like if something appeals to you, it's point, like you, your interest, go with that one. Just yeah. whatever yes. is pulling at you, just entertain it and just go in and then you never know where you get taken next. But like, yeah. if it's some healing mode, somebody's like, okay, you have to do EMDR. And you're like, I don't want to do EMDR. Like, don't do EMDR then do the one that appeals exactly. to you. Maybe you yeah. try that later, you know? So, yeah. okay. Um, let's talk about the thyroid because yeah. holy epidemic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What do we need to know? Number one is that TSH testing is not enough. And, and probably my favorite thing in the book is my charts that are on the thyroid. And so I go into each different lab test and tables nice. of what should be tested. TSH, free T4, free T3, Amazing. thyroid globulin antibodies, thyroperoxidase mm -hmm. antibodies. Some people like reverse T3. Um, and because if anybody, I mean, I just the number of times that I've heard of, of patients that have gone to their primary doctor for years and said, Hey, I have all the symptoms of low thyroid. Can you test my thyroid? They do a TSH and they're told it's normal. And then they go home and then they come to me and I test their free T4 and their free T3 levels and they're low or at their low mm -hmm. end of normal. Mm -hmm. So you're the, just to explain what it is, the thyroid is a gland in your neck that makes T4, which is converted to T3. And so TSH has nothing to do with it. So why are we testing that? TSH comes from your pituitary gland, which is in your brain. And my best analogy for it is, is it that whole system works like the heat in my office. So when I walked into the office this morning, I turned the temperature to 68. Thermostat detects that the temperature is too low. So it sends a signal to turn the heat on. Yeah, That's what your pituitary gland does to your thyroid. Your pituitary gland detects, hey, your, your thyroid levels are low. Let's turn the thyroid on. So what it does is release TSH. Yeah. Now, so regular medicine is assuming that if your TSH is high, that means your thyroid is low. I That can be true, but I've also seen right. many times where people have a normal TSH, but they're at the low end of T4 or they're at the low end of T3 or right. both. And so there's even the, the argument about what is optimal. When you look at the ranges on T4 and T3, they're, they're pretty large, the range. So why would I feel great at a T4 of 0 0.9 and you need your T4 to be 1.4 or 1.7? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. And so it's not just the one is, is like people aren't getting the right labs done. And so yeah. you'll never get it diagnosed. Um, 
and, and even like what I've seen that's even worse is like people going to the emergency room and they have a high TSH and the ER doctor puts them on Synthroid or thyroid medicine mm-hmm. and they don't take it and they come to me and they're like, can you test my thyroid fully? And we test and their T4 and T3 levels are like normal or high. So then at that point, you're literally like in a dangerous situation. If your thyroid levels are normal, the last thing you want to be doing is taking more thyroid medicine. Right. Um, so I, first of all is testing, testing, testing done properly. It's blood testing. It's done at your traditional lab. Um, get at a minimum, get your TSH free T4, free T3 tested. And then in the book, if you want to use the tables that I've written out of what are optimal ranges. And yeah, that's awesome. It, it should always, with any of these hormones we talk about, it's not just the lab, it's also the symptoms. So if your thyroid is at the low end, but you feel fantastic, I'm not going to do anything. But if your thyroid's even like middle or lower, but you have dry hair, dry skin, falling out hair, um, you're gaining weight, you're tired, you're having to take a nap every day. Right. I'll be like, well, let's get it up and see how you feel. Yeah. So it really is. It's kind of an art more than a science of working with the thyroid, I think. Um, And it just starts with the right kind of labs. Yeah. I like pulled up my list here. Cause I can't remember all these off the top of my head, but like, you know, when I really dove into thyroid, I was like, it's crazy to me, this only looking at TSH thing, because there's so many like cofactors, so many vitamins and minerals needed in all of these different stages. So like, if you look at all of them, you know, like for T4, you need iodine and riboflavin and vitamin C. And then to convert T4 to T3, the active form, you need selenium. And then in order to get T3 into the cell, you need vitamin D and vitamin A. And it's like, if you actually look at all of these steps, you might have some clues of like where the breakdown is. But if you're only looking at TSH, you don't even know any of that. It's so... (laughs) <laughs> it's so like that, how- that's where even I take it the next step is like, well, okay, now, you know, you've gotten to the point where we've diagnosed you with a low thyroid, then it's the why, right? And that's kind of what you're talking about. So, yeah. you know, if your T4 is good, but your T3 is not, then why are you not converting, right? Is it your gut, right? Maybe yeah. your diet's awesome, full of nutrients, but you're not digesting and you're not, yeah. then you're not absorbing, right? So then that's mm-hmm. a problem, yeah. right? And, and so it, look at your stomach acid production, look at what's going on in your microbiome. The way I was taught to think about the thyroid at the beginning of my career was thinking about it as a sponge for toxins. And so Mm, that's the other half of this book is, is the environmental toxins that are contributing to disease. And so the things that I wrote about are lead, mercury, other heavy metals, mold, glyphosate, um, the bath and beauty products. Um, in the introduction of the book, I go through my wife's morning routine of just going to bed and waking up and making breakfast and playing with our dogs and mm-hmm. the amount of toxins. Like there's some studies that show that women are exposed to over a hundred toxins before even leaving the house. And, and so wow. we're under this onslaught of right. these toxins when they get into our body, if we don't detox them and we can get down that, what is detox? One of their favorite places to get stored is your thyroid. Mm. And so in general, every cell in your body is surrounded by a membrane that has fat in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so any of these toxins that we mention are fat soluble. So that means they get stored in fat. Well, then that means they could get stored in every part of your body. What detox is in the liver is making those toxins water soluble. So then you can pee, poop and sweat them out. That's what Mm -hmm. detox is. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, which is still total, not totally clear to me as to why, but the thyroid is one of the favorite places for our environment to hang out. And so you go to your regular doctor and they're like, Hey, you have Hashimoto's disease right? Which is an autoimmune mm-hmm. disease of your thyroid. Well, the, you ask the doctor, why? Like, why did this happen? And then they're like, well, we don't know. It's just happening more and more. I diagnosed 10 patients with it today and, and here's some Synthroid yeah. and go home, right? <laughs> right. Well, what is an autoimmune disease? It is when your immune system identifies your own cells as invaders. So in general, your, your immune system's job is to recognize what's good and bad, right? What, what should be coming into your body and what should be staying out. Let's say your thyroid, you're 30 years old and your thyroid has been absorbing mercury and lead and glyphosate, and, and you have dysbiosis and toxins from your gut and your thyroid for 30 years has been filling up with these toxins. 
wouldn't it kind of make sense that the immune system is like, Hey, get out of here. Right. Yeah, and, right. and so that's my argument is like, why is, why are all these diseases happening? It's because we have all these foreign substances in our body that are getting stored. They cause mitochondrial damage. When the mitochondria die, the cells die. If the cells that should be making thyroid or testosterone or estrogen or progesterone start dying, then you're going to start getting hormonal imbalances. Mm -hmm. Um, so that kind of gets into the connection. Um, and so that's the deeper steps. Like, all right, now we've got a low thyroid. And if you're, when someone is ready, let's figure out why let's look at your gut. Let's test you for heavy metals. Let's test you for mold. Let's, I mean, we mm -hmm. probably already looked at your diet, but if we haven't, let's look at that. Mm -hmm. And the number one factor that inhibits and, and I kind of hate going back to it, but it is what it is. The number one factor that inhibits T4 to T3 conversion is stress. Right. Mm -hmm. So then it gets back to the adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where that's, the, you know, why I wrote this second book, because there's still more to the to the puzzle and, and all of these things are connected. And so we kind of have to be working on all of this at once. Yes. Um, kind of merging what you're talking about now with the spiritual, mental, emotional side of things, like the way I look at it is like. Why? toxins specifically, like some sort of something in the body, because that will trigger the stress response in the body. Also, it's like, we're under attack all the time yes. and you don't know why. And so you're trying to do all your mindset work and your emotional healing, and you're going to a shaman and a therapist and doing mindset work and all this stuff. And you're like, why am I still anxious all the time and can't sleep and all of this? And it's like, maybe there is, maybe you do have like a toxin issue, you know, and, or, or, and then that's going on. And then that makes it harder for you to do your mental, emotional work because the yes. HPA axis has been activated and you're just in this constant threat state all the time. So I love that you're like bringing both of those to the table. Cause you got to look at like, is this a physiological stressor or a, like a unresolved trauma stressor or both, you know, and it, it, creates this negative feedback loop. Yes. Um, I was at a health conference this weekend or a couple of weekends ago and, um, the microbiologist from microbiome labs, you know, those guys, mm -hmm. Karan Krishna, he was like talking about how, when you're missing certain beneficial bacteria in your gut, mm -hmm. like you increase your cortisol release because you start to get all these overgrowths and things like that. And so then that activates that stress response, which then decreases the good bacteria in your gut, which then makes it even worse. And you just keep recycling this, like cortisol goes into the gut. It's a stressor reactivates the stress response, which drops the good bacteria. And you just keep going round and around and around. And, you know, so I'm a, personally, I mean, you're way, way, way more expert on this for me, but I'm, I've, what I've become interested in is finding out like, are people missing the good bacteria? and their gut from chronic stress, from toxins, who knows what, can we help build some of those up to reduce that negative feedback loop while also doing breath work, meditating, you know, doing personal work and like to start, try to shift that whole physiological state into more calm without getting activated all the time. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, it kind of segues me to another thought of, of another chapter in the book, and, and it's the uh, female hormones mm. and uh, the connection of estrogen and progesterone to everything that you're saying to, to make that mm. negative feedback yeah. loop even worse. Okay, awesome. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing to talk about with women um, is estrogen dominance. Um, mm -hmm. And because I'd say probably three out of every four women that come to me are, I'm diagnosing with estrogen dominance. That's so what huge. is that? Right. And why, why does that contribute to what you were just saying? Um, first of all, this is relevant for premenopausal women. And, and so um, during the reproductive years, uh, the average cycle is 28 days and the, the cycle, the whole point of it is pregnancy. Right. And so mm -hmm. the whole 28 days is preparing for implantation and day one of the cycle is the first day of bleeding. So during the first 15 days, a woman makes estrogen and no progesterone. And starting around day 15, you start making progesterone mm -hmm. and you make that until the egg is either fertilized or not. If it is, then you make a ton of progesterone because that's your first pregnancy hormone. And if it's not, then the progesterone goes back to zero. The endometrium sheds and the whole cycle starts again, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what is happening is number one is, is we have all these xenoestrogens in our environment things like chlorine and birth control and sunscreens and makeup products. What is happening with some of these toxins is they are binding to your estrogen receptors. 
And so it's like you have twice the amount of estrogen that you should just because of the toxins in your environment. Mm -hmm. And then you throw in the mechanism that I said earlier, where the toxins are then also getting stored in the cells that should make these hormones. And then that's not happening. So then you're not making enough progesterone. And what you really need is this estrogen progesterone balance. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I mean, for my practice, it's three out of every four women. Uh, some symptoms of estrogen dominance are the classic symptoms that most women go to um, when they are uh, teenagers, usually going to their doctor and saying, hey, I have heavy periods. Hey, I mm -hmm. have PMS. I have fibroids. I have endometriosis, mm -hmm. fatigue, hair loss, cold hands and feet, depression, anxiety. Um, so any of these, you know, symptoms that then they're like, well, here, take birth control. And, and then that suppresses the whole pituitary gland. And then they stay on birth control until they want to get pregnant and then they come off of it and they're like, what the heck? My hormones are all screwed up. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the biggest things I see when a woman is estrogen dominant is it's extremely difficult to get the anxiety under control. And, and the biggest benefit I see from getting the progesterone balanced is a reduction in anxiety. So I've seen lots of women over the years that are like, Hey, I am doing yoga. Hey, I've been in therapy for two yeah. years. I'm meditating. <laughs> I'm exercising. I'm doing everything I should. Mm -hmm. I've done gut stuff. And uh -huh. like, I still am like crazy or like, I still can't like, you know, right. week before my period, it's like a mess. Yeah. And so when we get the hormones balanced, then everything else starts working better right? The, the meditation, the yoga, the exercise, all right. those things work better when you're hormonally balanced. So, um, so are you saying even take it another step further is like, you could be doing all this stuff, but if your hormones aren't, are getting in the way and not supporting your body right. to function properly. And then, so then your progesterone's low or your estrogen's high. And then that makes your cortisol worse. Right. Cause you're stressed out all the time and you can't right. stop it. You can't sleep. Um, and then, you know, then you're stressed out and you can't sleep. Then your gut microbiome starts falling apart. Right. And then that, you know, then that makes your detox worse and then makes more toxins. And then your Hashimoto's gets worse. And, and again, yeah. like this. And eventually your blood sugar goes up and yes. all. Of, um, right. so are you saying the big piece that women with estrogen dominance might be missing is some sort of toxin, heavy metals, something like that. Xenoestrogens, like the stuff in their environment. It's always the like, first thing I like to look at uh -huh. you know, when, when women are like, why, why do I have estrogen dominance? And, and the same is true for testosterone. So we could, that's the other hormone is testosterone. And I was diagnosed with low T at 32. And, and so I share that story in the book and it's embarrassing, but it is what it is. I mean, it happens and I've diagnosed uh, super men common. younger than me. Super yeah. common. Real yeah. quick on the estrogen dominance before we shift over to that one. Um, are there certain metals that you have found to be highly correlated with estrogen estrogen dominance? I wouldn't say that I've found a specific okay. toxin correlated to any condition. In, in my opinion, okay. whether okay. it's lead or mercury or yeah. cesium or thallium or mold or glyphosate, in one person it can be autism, in another person it can be uh thyroid imbalance, another person it can be your gut's a mess. And so mm -hmm. It, the general way I look at this is the bucket example uh, of we're yeah. born with a bucket and we fill that bucket. Right. So I'm trying to identify um, what is in your bucket and to empty it. So yeah. there's not a specific one that I would look for. I would just try to look at all the ones that I can test and, and just help someone detox. So like with detox, you know, you got to have binders, you, you know, are, do you have protocols in the book for people mm -hmm. to follow? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I just got it yesterday, so for, by the way. So I haven't, haven't had a chance to check that. That's cool. What, what a valuable resource for people, especially on the thyroid. I know the tests really elude people a lot. They're like, I don't, what am I supposed to know? <laughs> so there's a guide awesome. there for any listeners that want to get it that like, you can you yeah. probably know more about your thyroid testing than your regular doctor will um, just from one chapter in the book. Okay. Um, and, Let's and then, some... like for different toxins, there's different ways to detox. So I do talk about different things nice. that I've used for detox for different. Amazing. Toxins. Okay. Let's not forget the testosterone thing. Cause okay. I don't want the guys to be like, <laughs> <laughs> all right. What do guys need to know about? Or I mean, women too, obviously, what, right. what do we need to know about testosterone? So same deal, like where, you know, what I was mentioning is that like so many, like when women are like, why, why am I estrogen dominant? And, and my answer is, is just being alive in 2022 or 2023. <laughs> That's your yeah. risk because 
it's in baby food, it's in breast milk, it's you can pick up toxins before you're even born because they cross the placenta. Mm -hmm. um, when you walk outside, everything you touch, like so they're everywhere and, and they're affecting us differently. Um, crazy story I read the other day out of New Zealand is, is that they tested the rain and they are finding massive amounts of microplastics in the rain. Wow. So literally when it's raining, it's, it's raining down plastic on us <laughs> and they it's found those microplastics in the testes. So wow. why, why are like sperm rates so low? Why is testosterone so low? Well, it, like if your testes, another interesting thing uh, is workout clothes. When you start wow. reading labels, they're putting plastics into workout clothes. Those are right against your skin. One of the ways that we stop toxins from getting in is through the skin. And then if you're wearing some skin tight clothes that are just full of plastic, you know, and, and so then you're absorbing them and it's like, interesting. that's what I'm saying. Like the more you dig into this, they're everywhere. And, and so, yeah, men, you know, I was diagnosed at 32 with low T. Um, when the doctors even suggested to me, I was kind of like F you like yeah. <laughs> 32, like I don't have low T yeah. and they tested it and it was in the tank. And I was like, okay, this explains like the way I've felt for a lot right. of years. Um, which and, will you explain what that is just in case yeah. listeners don't know for, for me, I'd say the two biggest symptom, my, the one that bothered me the most over the years is like, I've always been into exercise. I always like to work out and had a lot of friends that were into that. And like, I felt like my body never looked like they did. And, yeah. and in the beginning, I would say it was, you know, I would also go to McDonald's or something after working out. So that was, yeah, but so did they, right. So did they. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, and then my diet got right. And, and I was still just like, what the heck? Like I'm spending more time in here and like my abs mm -hmm. aren't cut up the way I want them to. I'm not like throwing three plates on there on the bench. Like why? Mm -hmm. And so and then the other thing I'd say is, is just a lower sex drive for me. Yeah. That like, and that was a big reason for drinking for me is because when I drank, like my sex drive would go up. And if I didn't, wow. it was very low. And I think it was the low T. Um, so um, I, can we just highlight that real quick for compassion for, I have like, I, I can't stand shame around addictions. I'm like, no, 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 no. Something's wrong. And that's the only thing that you have found to feel yes. better. Yeah. Compassion. So like, yeah. what's wrong? Yeah. <laughs> you right. know, like that's such yeah. a great story for that. It's just like, okay, like I had no idea that yeah. I had low testosterone. And of course, you know, like you're a young guy. Yeah. So, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, and then also depressed mood, right? Yes. Like it just, yeah. yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah. So the, she did a urine test at first, which is, I don't, I don't think that's a good test. So I was like, I want to do a blood test to confirm this. And sure enough, my testosterone was like two something. Mm -hmm. So normal range is like two to 1100, which mm -hmm. is also psychotic. How could one person be normal right. at 200, another person 1100. <laughs> right. So they say like an optimal testosterone for a man is about 800. And mm -hmm. so I was two. And so she's like, do you want testosterone replacement? I was like, yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. I, we didn't talk about side effects. So, so this is right. the story to share in the book too. But um, so I went on it and it, I mean, it literally probably only took like a month before all of a sudden, like my body started changing. And like, I was not on like a, a high dose or anything. I was on a low dose just to get me to a level of about 800, uh -huh. and, but everything changed my mood, my energy. I was lifting weights and playing two hours of basketball on the same day. Like my sex drive was great. And it was mm -hmm. just like, I felt good. Like I was excited to get up every day. Mm -hmm. And then I met my wife and, um, we started talking about having kids and I, I never really thought about it. Didn't consider it. And this is embarrassing for me as a doctor, but, um, <laughs> I did a sperm test and there was zero. And I was like, what the heck? Cause you would think testosterone makes you fertile. Cause it does when it's, you know, produced naturally. Yeah. Well, just like what I described with the TSH from your pituitary gland, your brain also makes LH and FSH. And those are signals that in women cause you to ovulate and in men cause you to make testosterone and to make you make sperm. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're taking a hormone, you shut off the signal from the brain. Right. So you, cause right. hey, my body's like, Hey, this guy has plenty of testosterone. We didn't need to, we don't need to make any. Makes well, yeah. that's fine for LH because LH is what tells a man to make testosterone, but FSH is what tells us to make sperm. Mm. So despite having a great testosterone count, my sperm was literally zero. 
And oh. that was one of the worst days of my life. Cause I was like, what did I do to myself? Right. So I make lots of sperm again. Um, I became an expert in supplements for fertility for men and for, um, and I also used a medication called clomiphene, which is a, a lot of men take it just to boost their testosterone. Women take it to ovulate women going through who have had fertility issues have probably been put on clomiphene. What it does is basically cause you to make more LH and FSH. Hmm. So instead of putting on testosterone, I started using clomiphene to make FSH and LH at six months I tested and I was still zero. And then at 12 months I tested again and it was normal. And, and so wow. that's a huge thing that I've always talked about with men huge. I work with is, is like, cause I've had men that their doctors didn't tell them either. And I was like, Whoa, like no one's talking about, about that side effect of like, no one's talking about that. I, you're the first doctor I've ever heard specifically lay that out that clearly. That is so important for guys on yeah. TRT to know. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you for sharing your yeah. embarrassing story, but yeah. it's, that is so helpful for so many yeah. people. So thank you. Wow. Yeah, okay. It's, so it's something that, you know, they kind of like say you should start testing for at 40. I don't know with my experience, like if a man comes to me and, and their mood is depressed and they're like, Hey, like, I feel like I'm carrying some extra fat or I'm having relationship issues or, or, or whatever it is. Like I'm low energy. Like I'm going to test their thyroid. I'm going to test their adrenals, but I'm also going to test their testosterone and, and talk to them, right? Like, Hey, you, at this age, I think supplements are the best for you at this age, clomiphene right. and supplements. Sometimes you could use testosterone and clomiphene. So then you get really good levels and you don't shut out your per sperm production. So I get into all that stuff. Um, yeah. and low T is something that women can experience too. And, and so I see it more in postmenopausal women, um, that the testosterone really drops, but I, I've got a number of premenopausal women that, um, we test them and because of similar symptoms and, and we will replace it at, at a much lower dose, um, than, than a man, but still it can be really beneficial for women too. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm curious your thoughts. I'm being selfish right now, but, um, I did some lab work with a uh, life force. I'm kind of using, mm -hmm. it's kind of cool. They like have somebody come to your house and then you get like a call with a functional medicine doctor. And my testosterone was like in range, even on their, like more, they're more on the functional medicine side. Yeah. So it's like the more optimal one. <clears throat> it was in range, but it was on the lower side. And the, the doc told me that she really recommended I get on DHEA. And mm -hmm. I was kind of like, oh, I don't know how I feel about it. I haven't done it yet. Cause I'm like, maybe, but I feel amazing. <laughs> I don't know what thoughts on that. Yeah. Send her a copy of my book. Okay. Um, Cause I actually get into DHEA and it, it's kind of, it's going to probably go against what you've read or heard, but there's actually pretty significant evidence that DHEA doesn't even boost testosterone. Really? Yeah. And so I get into the history a little bit of DHEA, but um, I'll read it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, even me, like the first time I kind of thought I had it, I went on DHEA and it didn't do anything for me with my mm. testosterone, but okay, it, what they found, I mean, DHEA like a long time ago was marketed as like the fountain of youth supplement like that. This is like right years ago. Right. Right. And so that was not true. Right. That was like a snake oil type deal. <laughs> and then, so, but even now, like the doctor you met with is like, Hey, t take DHEA to, to boost your testosterone. It doesn't do it. It do won't boost Interesting. it. And, and so what they've actually found, the reason that DHEA is beneficial is more for cardiovascular reasons, because mm. your body actually has receptors specifically just for DHEA. And most people, the way they think of DHEA is like, Hey, take it because it's a precursor to testosterone. So if you right. have more, you'll make more tea. Right. No, no. the, the, wow. the research actually shows that the only benefit you'll see from DHEA is because it has its own receptors. So, um, and I was also fooled and it, and, and so that's something that, you know, I, in the book, there's over 300 evidence articles that I've cited wow. uh, to, to, to this. <laughs> Cool. And, and so that's something really interesting, right? That, yeah. That I was, th that, that's what I'm saying. Like doctors or professionals, we do our best, but sometimes right. you have to live through this stuff to actually really dig deep enough into yeah. it. Because the general thought is, yeah, DHEA equals more to stuff. Right. No. Wow. Yeah, or, cool. or, or, what it would actually probably only do, at least what it did to me is give me more acne, which I was wow. like, this sucks. Okay. Thanks um, for sharing that. I can't wait to dig deeper into that one. Um, so I, I would not take the DHEA. 
Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I, I just had a bad feeling about it. I'm like, I don't know, man, I'm going to do all you. the other boosters, natural boosters of DHEA. Like my omega threes were a little low. Maybe it's that like, I'm, you know, <laughs> so yeah. I'm more yeah. prone to like supporting my body and doing what it needs to do than just replacing things. It's like, because if it, if DHEA is low, there's a lot of other things off too, because of whatever I'm missing that needs that, you know what I mean? So right. it's like, what am I not supporting? Okay. Um, real quick, just, I, I told you I wouldn't keep you more than an hour, but it's just so good. I can't stop. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's talk about, actually, I want to hit on mold really quick. That's your chapter yeah. eight. Yeah. I had a client recently. Yeah. She's like in, you know, been in this like toxic, it must've been intuitive. Like she was in this toxin boot camp, like coursing thing oh. from the stock. Uh-huh. And then she came to me and I, I knew something was seriously wrong. Cause she got like s- throwing up sick for like a week straight and like, didn't lose a single pound. Like her mood is depressed. I mean, that's kind of weird. You know, I was like something deeper here. Um, we did all her gut labs and stuff and we're, you know, in the process and she goes, guess what? She's like, my car found is like totaled because it had some sort of weird water leak going on in it. And when they ripped the top of the car off black mold, like the little cover, you know, fabric, black mold completely. She's like, since I've gotten out of that, I, she's like, I'm like a different person, like already, like, you know, we've been doing some gut rebuilding stuff too, but it was like, I mean, that sucks. You have no idea the car you're driving around and every single day is just full of black mold, you know? So can you talk about mold, why people need to think about this? Besides gut health, it's the second most common thing that I treat. Wow. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, And mold can cause everything from, I mean, so again, I don't want to say it causes it, but contributes. Right. And so if if someone has an immune dysfunction, if someone has brain fog, if someone has hormonal imbalances, pot syndrome, uh, neuro, neuro symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, like it can literally present as anything. And what is happening is, is that most, almost nobody that I've ever worked with knew that they were being exposed to mold. Like we had to go down that road, your client that, uh, found it in their car. So mold when it's present releases spores and that's how it replicates. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about toxins Mold also releases what are called mycotoxins. That is its defense mechanism. Mycotoxins kill things around the mold. And that is what gets into our bodies and causes the cell death that I'm talking about. And same deal that that can accumulate anywhere, right? And so I could take every person I've ever worked with with mold and they all can complain of a different symptom. And and Mm -hmm. we're... um, What's crazy is like when I was doing the research for this book, there's this book uh, that we use in med school called The Pathologic Basis of Disease, which is a 1700 page, like the thickest textbook you've ever seen with the smallest print you've ever seen. And it's supposed to have everything in it that could go wrong with the body. There's not, there's two pages in the entire book about mold and it's just about mold allergies. Somebody with a mold allergy is not going to get toxic because they're going to know they're being exposed to mold. So they're going to get away from it. When you're just breathing it in day after day, it's just getting absorbed. And so most people are getting it from their homes. And so my number one screening question when I'm debating whether to test someone for mycotoxins is, have you ever had water damage? Yeah. And what I've even seen is people are like, no, I've lived in a brand new home for 20 years, never had a problem. But when I was a little kid, my parents' basement used to flood all the time and we test them and 50 years later, they still have huge levels, right? And some people can live with those levels for 60 years and never get sick. Some people could be in it for two months and get sick. Yeah. I have only once ever worked with a family where everybody in the house was sick. So Hmm. 99% of the time it is you know, and that's usually, you know, they'll have a visit with me and then they go home and tell their wife or husband, like, Hey, the doctor thinks I have mold. And the spouse is like, well, that doctor's full of shit because excuse me, full of crap because you're good. um, (laughs) Yeah. Um, because I'm fine and our kids are fine. Right. But that's what always, I always see it's one person that's affected. And that gets into, we all have different buckets. Um, right. So the, I've only caught a couple people that were getting it from their cars, but that is actually the the top three places that we actually get it from is our work or home environment, our cars and our food. Um, And food Mm -hmm. is usually the least concerning to me. The moldiest food I think is coffee. Um, Coffee is full of mycotoxins. 
Um, if you get an organic coffee, it's probably even more full of mycotoxins because it doesn't have the chemicals to kill the mold. Um, mm. But that's usually, I'm not worried about food. I'm usually worried about the airborne exposure. Yeah. Um, and so we can test your body. It's urine testing where you send off a urine sample nice. and we could tell you, I mean, the levels should be zero. You shouldn't have mycotoxins yeah. in your body, but if you do, and this is a great point, um, especially we're coming to the end, but the first step in any kind of detox is to stop exposure. Right. So if you suspect mold, test your body and then test your home or your office, because if we diagnose you with mold toxicity and you it's in your house and you're sleeping there every night and you're working from home, we're going to be on that negative feedback loop where we're trying to detox and you're breathing it in. So it's just keeps going around. So whether we talk about lead, mercury, mold, mm -hmm. glyphosate or whatever, always the first step in detox, you have to stop the exposure. And, How do you so, recommend people test their homes for mold? Uh, you, for mycotoxins. And so there's a lab that I use. I don't have any affiliation with them. It's called real time labs. Um, they're out of Texas. And what they do is they have you collect three grams of dust from mm -hmm. your HVAC filter usually. And okay. because like the HVAC is like the lungs of your house. So a lot of people also be like, well, it's in the basement and I don't ever go in there. If it's in one room, it's in every room. And yeah. so through the, it's called an EMMA test, E-M-M-A, and it's specifically for mycotoxins. Okay. I, I really don't recommend using your local mold inspector, unfortunately, because they test for spores and spores are not, that's again, what causes allergies. Spores are bigger than mycotoxins. So your house can test negative for spores, but there's still okay. toxins in there. And know. for whatever reason, mycotoxin testing is not mainstream yet. And your traditional inspector is still just doing the spore stuff. So get mycotoxin testing nice. is my advice. Nice. Super helpful. Okay. So stop, stop it from happening. And then just reach out to Dr. I have Boston. a whole, all the supplements, <laughs> nutrients yeah. I use. And actually my favorite tool for mold detox is infrared sauna. Um, mm. And it's because one of the ways that we detox is sweating. Um, and the other thing is the infrared waves kind of help kill off some of the mycotoxins. So nice. um, infrared sauna is my treatment of choice for sure for mold. Okay. Awesome. I literally just got mine right before we started. Nice. It's sitting right next to me. That was my Amazing. Christmas present to myself. So, oh yeah. man, this is so incredibly helpful. I think probably everybody listening has gotten a pretty good idea of how helpful your book is going to be. Cause you're just yeah. like, let me very <laughs> clearly and specifically lay this out for you, what's going on and what you can do about it. That's so, it's so helpful. And I, that's why I told you last time, but I so appreciate it's so helpful to have someone who is actively practicing and in the trenches every single day, seeing the stuff all the time, take the time out to write a book, to share with people. Right. Cause I don't know about you, but I don't really want to get preached a bunch of theory. You know, uh, I want like what's actually going on and a lot of experience and that's what you've brought. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. And these, these subjects, right. So there's the thyroid mm -hmm. chapter, adrenals, detox, heavy metals. Like these are subjects that entire books can be written about. Yeah. For me, what I've tried to share is because I've been in the trenches for 10 years with people and like I continue to be, it's what, how does, what do you need to do to heal? Not like, yeah. you know, every piece of science of like right. how this all works and all of that, because A, that could get a little boring for someone and B, yes. like a lot of that doesn't help you. So for me, it's like, <laughs> I don't like to waste people's time. My books right. aren't that long. They're pretty easy to read because yeah. it's like what do you need? Like, like, let's not make this so complicated. Let's just get, yeah. figure out what's wrong and get it right and, and enjoy your life. I appreciate that so much. So guys, it's get the funk out and funk is F U N C. Okay. F U N C get the funk out. Um, we will link it in the show notes. Um, also you guys can visit Dr. Cause's website. It's doc slash K O Z. Cause your last name is kind of hard. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, doc K O Z dot com doc slash cause dot com. And then we'll link up this and, and we'll put your other book in the show notes to the, your first one unfunk your gut. Um, thank you. Thank yeah. you for doing this. Thank yeah, you for taking nice the time. You. Thank you for this having such me. a helpful effort episode. So thank, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.